This is NPR's Weekend Edition. I'm Scott Simon. Luis Rodriguez says it's important to look for poetry not only in extraordinary places, but in the most mundane, in cracks on the walls, the faces of friends, the palms of children. Mr. Rodriguez, who now lives in Chicago, is a professional poet and author who uses the street cred of his past to try to work against gang violence. Mr. Rodriguez himself grew up as a gang member in East Los Angeles. This fall, he received the Hispanic Heritage Award for Literature. He has two new books out this season, a book of poems called Troche Moche, essentially Helter Skelter in Spanish, and a new children's book, America is Her Name. Luis Rodriguez joins us from our studios in Chicago, and thanks very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. I, I use that phrase, street cred, in the introduction. How long does that last when you become a poet? Well, I think you kind of get away from a lot of uh, whatever troubles you were in. I think poetry is a very healing art, and I think I've healed a lot of uh, whatever I had as growing up as a young person, whatever violence and rage. I think in many ways the poetry has allowed me to transcend it, and I think poet um, adds just another element to my life, another trajectory to my life. Mr. Rodriguez, help, help us understand what I, I guess you referred to in so many words as the healing power of poetry in your life. I mean, how does that feel when you let something in and it becomes a part of your life and it seems to smooth out others? Well, it's it's connected to the creativity of any artist, you know, and if you talk to artists, you know that they they begin to tap into something that is very powerful, as I say in my book, inexhaustible. Mm-hmm. When you start creating things, you start using words in creative, unique, interesting ways, you start realizing that you can overcome some of the most basic troubles you may be in because creativity is... Uh, as I say, all powerful, very uh, is inexhaustible, and can do almost anything. In in your children's book, America is her name. You uh, the protagonist, a young woman named America, who's growing up in the Pilsen neighborhood there in Chicago, feels that in her soul, doesn't she? Yeah, and I wanted young kids to be able to know that they can get that poetry now. The problem is that I think we tend to see poetry as a more mature art. Yeah. Uh, you can develop it, of course, more mature uh, as you get older. But I think poetry should be something that young kids should be introduced to very early. Um, you know, I was going to have you read your poems first, but it naturally suggests itself. I'm wondering if you could re- read a page from your children's book first. Oh, sure. I had, I had one in mind. It, it's the section where America has just been exposed to writing. She's just begun to write herself, and, and it's the section where it begins, America is sad. Will this be my life, she wonders? America is sad. Will this be my life, she wonders, not to write? To clean houses, get married, have children, to wait for the factory to feed us. She sees in her mind all of the sullen faces that look out of third floor windows when she walks to school and the desperate men without jobs standing on street corners. They all seem trapped, like flowers in a vase full of song and color, yet stuck in a gray world where they can't find a way out. Will this be my life? You know how that feels? Yeah, I think so. I think growing up in South Central LA in the East LA area, mm-hmm. there didn't seem to be a lot of um, poetry thrown at us. You know what I'm trying to say? We were kind of confined to a world. The sense was that you couldn't get out of this world. You were you were supposed to conform to the poverty, to the factories, to whatever people said. This was our lot, and I don't, I didn't really believe that. And I think that poetry allowed me to to see that I didn't have to believe that. How did how did you find poetry, Mr. Rodriguez? You know, I. I I think I had it for a long time. It's just that it took me a while. I was in jail as a juvenile, and I began to express my, myself through words. I don't know why. I wasn't a very good student. I was not good at language, but somehow me putting words down was very um, healing for me even then. I could already sense something was happening, and I got something out of just putting down my thoughts and my feelings and, and descriptive points of my life that um, I, I think I was beginning to get into poetry then without even knowing what poetry was. Yo voy a mi, page 33. Oh, yeah. I love this poem. Oh, good, because this is a, an, a kind of an homage to the Puerto Rican community of uh, Humboldt Park. Right, which I will explain that, you know, there, there are some readers that might remember Saul Bellow, another obviously mm-hmm. great Chicago writer. Uh, Saul Bellow's uh, book, Humboldt's Gift, which is about Humboldt Park when it was Principally, it must be said, a, a Jewish community, and of course right. now it's Puerto Rican. And I, I lived there for eight years when I first got here. This is this is where I lived. Mm-hmm. So the poem is Yo Voy a Mi, and it's for Arlene Osuna and the people of Humble Park. Tuck 
Painted bricks scrapes up against dead branches with weathered gray backstairs and alleys scrawled with breath. These are nights of girls shrieking, of drunken men in muddled Spanish pulling women out of their depths. These are nights of young couples, newlywed poor, threatening to pay rent while an eruption of semi-automatics welcomes them and Toyota hatchbacks cruise by with large speakers out the back. Dumping street mixes and, with de and decals of your boy Ami and Soy Boricua on their windows, Asi y Asa. Tri-colored flags are sold at the edge of El Parque Humboldt next to Pentecostals enticing sinners and housewives to open-air tents while a live band jumpstarts the vibes in their chests. And peddlers prepare mofongo and piraguas for the shift-changing gente de trabajo. Children race ahead of their mothers who are busy averiguando la mortificación of life to neighbors with homemade pasteles and paper sacks. Peace deterred traffic for summer block parties as fire hydrants when inner tubes wrapped around the openings blast relief to the shorties browning beneath a shearing sun. Nearby, my teenage neighbor with a prosthetic foot after the real one had been accidentally shot off when she was three calls over 13-year-old Arlene, who sometimes watches over my one-year-old son who is barely able to walk yet as fast when one isn't looking. I see y asa. Two years later, Arlene is killed when a bullet meant for her boyfriend claims her instead. Mingo next door has chickens and roosters in the backyard. He dreams of Ponce and its breezes, yet lures part of the island to Mozart Street. My Jamaican neighbor also yearns for Caribbean waters, but his Alabama-born wife only misses the open spaces of her home. Sometime later, we see their sons in the juvenile court when my oldest boy has a hearing at the same time. One day, a coffee-colored dove lands on my head outside my front door. It ambles to my shoulder and stays there. I end up getting a cage and keeping it for a few days until the constant cooing and spurts of dove wails grate on my nerves. I finally had it with the bird, when my wife and I almost come to blows over whether we should cover the cage to keep it quiet. I give the damn thing to Mingo. On hot weekends, neighbors aim speakers out their windows while others then push out their own sounds and the competing salsa permeates the streets while local drug dealers appear with school-age boys as lookouts. After a while, I don't mind the racket outside, but just don't have a faucet leak in the kitchen or I go nuts. I see y asa. Oh, Arlene, sweet Arlene, with straight burnished hair and luminous eyes, with wisp of girl legs and morning sacraments of smile, framed by wrought iron fences. Bendita, you deserve more than this world would give. That's a novel. I put a lot of Humble Park in that poem. Yeah. It's a very uh, interesting, very beautiful community in the sense of the people. Yeah. It's a very poor community, as you can imagine. Yeah. has a lot of violence, but the people are always alive, and the people always make things right when everything seems to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rodriguez, do you mind if we talk about your son? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, what's his name? His name is Ramiro Rodriguez, who's 23 years old and uh, is the basis for my uh, memoir, Always Running. Well, the basis in the sense that I really wrote the book for him, describing my life for him, so maybe he could learn something from what I went through. Okay, and is your son, well, I, I mean, I don't want to be oblique, and yet I want to give you your privacy. Where, where is your son living? Well, I, the problem with that is, that, of course, I started talking about him to everybody, so it's really hard to be too private. I, my son is in prison as we speak. He was convicted in September of three counts of attempted murder and was given 28 years in a maximum security prison. So, But it's still a very hard thing to talk about because I tried, as you know, real hard to um, – have my son not end up like this. That was really one of my goals, that he would not have to be in prison or in drugs or alcoholic or dead because that seemed to be the way I was going, and I was barely able to get out of it, and I didn't want my own kids to have to go through this. 